All right, everyone. Thank you so much for hopping on today's webinar. We're going to talk about how to analyze multifamily property financials. We're going to look at the T12. We're going to look at the rent roll. We're going to figure out how do we add value um, when we look at these different things and, and then just kind of go from there. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. The way I'm going to do it this time is we're not going to go through a presentation. I'm, I'm actually going to show you an actual rent roll, an actual T12. And um, that way we could go through an actual thing and you don't have to sit through, you know, a fake presentation that may or may not be relevant today. So anyway, let me open up. Oh God, there's so many things. Hold on. I got to move all this crap out of the way. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's, let's look at a deal that we actually bought end of uh, last year in December. It doesn't have the full 12 month financials. It just has the past three months because obviously we close on it in December, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same except you're, you know, in 12 months or I'm sorry, nine more months, you're going to see numbers all across rather than just in the past three months. But the idea is the same. The concept is the same. So we're just going to go through this because this will be um, easier to go through. I would love to do a deal that's on the market, but unfortunately I'm not allowed to because we sign non-disclosure um, agreements whenever we get these documents. So I have to go over a deal that we own. Otherwise, I'd be violating the rules. So having said that, let's talk about what is what is a T12 and what is a rent roll uh, in the first place. So a T12, for those that don't know, basically means trailing 12. And what that means is it's basically the profit and loss statement of the past 12 months. So sometimes you might hear it called uh, T12. It might be called uh, trailing 12. It might be called uh, profit and loss statement, whatever, but it all means the exact same thing. Most people in the business refer to it as a T12. And I recommend that if you're in the multifamily business that you actually do use those terms because it lets brokers and other people know that you understand uh, the business language. So having said that, let's just go with the T12. Um, the other thing is the rent roll. What is a rent roll? A rent roll basically shows all of the residents when they moved in, when their lease expires, how much they're paying, what other charges they're paying for, and basically gives you basic information about the leases of the tenants that occupy the property. Um, you're not going to be able to see the specific tenants, you know, qualifications as in their personal income, their pay stubs, all that stuff. You, you'd have to get that when you do due diligence on a property in person. Um, so you're not going to see that on a rent roll, but you will see basic information. And so uh, to me, that's that's uh, that's good enough. So having said that, let's go ahead and get started. For those of you that have questions, if you have questions, um, you know, you could either unmute yourself and ask me and I'll answer it that way. Or if you want, you could put it in the chat and I will answer them all at the end. Um, so again, let's start with the T12. And again, it shows at the top, as you can see, April 22 up to March of 23. That's basically 12 months. We didn't own it uh, until December. And so that's why you only see numbers in that December month. Uh, most of the time when you're buying a property, the, the owner usually would have had the property for at least 12 months most of the time. So you're going to see full financials. Uh, but anyway, as you can see at the top of this, it's usually divided into two major sections. You've got the income section up top, right, right over here. So from all of this, this is all the income section right there. And then down below that, you've got the expense section. Um, as you can see, expenses go from here all the way down to, to this, right? All the way down to this line, total expenses. And then afterwards, you've got the net operating income. The net operating income is basically all of your income minus your expenses. But here's something important that you have to realize is that it does not include your mortgage. So your mortgage cost is not part of the NOI. So you have a term in, 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 uh, in multifamily and in commercial real estate called above the line. Uh, and then another term is, is below the line. Above the line expenses are basically expenses or income line items that affect the NOI. So that's why they're called above the line. They're above the NOI line. And then you've got below the line expenses, which are things like your mortgage, your asset management fee. Your asset management fee is, is not a property expense. That's a, that's a partnership expense. So it's a below the line expense. It doesn't affect the value of the property. Uh, same thing with capital expenses. So if you're going in and rehabbing a property and updating units, that's not, that's not something that's, you know, that's, uh, I guess, affects the NOI. So, so it goes below the line. It's called a below the line expense. And it doesn't affect the value of the deal because it's not a reoccurring expense. It's a one-time expense. 
um, that you pay to update the units. And that's pretty much it. And so having said that, let's go back up and let's start this off with the income portion of this and then just kind of work our way down. So when in, with, with income, anytime you get a T12, it's going to start off with the rental income and then it's going to have the other income uh, line items. Now, I recommend whenever you go through a T12 is that you actually read through this line by line. I would not say, oh, you know what? Total income is X amount and then move on to the next thing. You actually have to open the document go through every single line item and see if it makes sense or not. So having said that, as you can see, the first line is usually the gross potential rent. Uh, that there should be rent. Um, gross potential rent is basically the maximum amount of rent that the property could generate. And as you can see in this case, it says the maximum amount of rent, if everybody was at market level, would be $125,000 per month you will never see a property that achieves maximum gross potential rent because you'll always have physical vacancy, meaning people not occupying the units. Plus you'll always have economic vacancy. And what economic vacancy is, is it's basically, you know, leases. It's, it's you know, when you're generating income that is below what the physical occupancy income should be. So just to give you an example, let's say you lease out a unit at $1,000. 12 months from now, that same unit is worth you know twelve hundred dollars per per month, uh, but you've got a lease for you know six more months, seven more months on on eleven thousand dollars. What that means is you're losing two hundred dollars per month because you've got an older lease, and so that would be considered economic vacancy. Another thing that would be considered economic vacancy are things like you know um, uncollectible rent, maybe because you've got bad debt, maybe you've got delinquency. So that adds to your economic vacancy. You've got maybe employee units, right? Like in this case, we have uh, two employees that have uh, that get discounts on their units, and we're going to change that in the future. But anyway, the point is that all adds to the economic vacancy. So when you get the gross potential rent, that's the maximum potential rent on the property. And then you reduce all of these other factors like loss to lease, which is when you have you know, like I said, a higher rent today versus what you signed the lease at six months ago, seven months ago. Um, you've got vacancy loss, you've got loss to employees, you've got, you know, bad debt, all that sort of stuff. Then that gives you the net actual rental income. So as you can see here, our potential income on the rent was 125. But then after you take out all of these other expenses, now we're down to $106,000. So that's a, that's a pretty big gap. That's about $20,000. And that's normal. Every property is going to be like this. That's completely normal. So that is basically how rental income is calculated. I would, you know, whenever you're looking at this, I would dismiss this, right? I would focus a lot on what is the actual net rental income. Obviously, I would look at you know, all these other factors and see how I can fix the property. How can I reduce the, the economic vacancy? All of this here is considered economic vacancy. So I would look at this and think, well, how can I reduce economic vacancy? Like I can tell you one of the things we could do, um, you know, is we're, we're going to change this so we don't have uh, employee discounted units. Uh, but obviously, we don't want to make too many changes. We just bought the property in December. We're making one change at a time. You don't want to go in and, and make 100 changes in like three months. So we're taking it one step at a time. But the point here is you've got basically this you could burn off. Um, uncollectible rent, you're always going to have that, right? Um, over time, we do want to reduce this as much as possible closer to zero, but you're never going to get it to zero. Um, loss to lease is actually not a bad thing, in my opinion. What that means is you're pushing rent. And if you don't have a loss to lease, what that means is rent isn't actually going up. So to me, loss to lease is not a big problem. And then, I'll, of course, I would always want to reduce vacancy loss. This property right now is 100% pre-leased, meaning that every single unit um, is leased. So as people move in, we're going to have $0 in vacancy loss over the next month or so. If you have any questions about this before we move on, let me know down in the chat or just unmute yourself and I'd be happy to answer that. Any questions you've got? Let's see. Uh, we've got a few questions. Abbas, what do the pre pretending numbers represent? 4,000, 4,400, 5,000. Oh, you mean, you mean over here? So this is the, every single property management company has their own, uh, you know, way of identifying all these different expenses. Uh, sometimes they have these codes, sometimes they don't, but really I would not, don't worry about this too much. This is just for the property management company internal metrics. So it's not standardized. 
No, no, no. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, is that a standardized now? Okay. So we'll move on. Can you clarify the difference between economic vacancy and loss to lease? So Andrew, economic vacancy, oh, I got an answer. So loss to lease is part of economic vacancy. All of these different things add up to economic vacancy. All right, cool. So moving on from that, let's move on to other income. The next thing you want to look at is what other income sources does the property have? So currently they're charging application fees. As, as you can see, we've got, you know, higher application fees uh, in the last month because we had a lot of applicants. Um, new late charges. This is basically if you've got a late, late charge, somebody doesn't pay rent on time. These are always good. It's kind of like free money. Uh, miscellaneous income, month to month fees. This is if somebody's on a month to month lease. NSF charges, pet charges, right? hundred bucks per month, pest control fee. You've got admin fees. That's pretty good. Uh, utilities, water, trash, all that stuff. And then uh, interest income. So overall, we've got an additional about five to $6,000 a month of other income. And so when you add your base rental income of 106,000, and then you add your, you know, your other income, that gives you your total income in this case of 112,000 for the month of March. The month prior to that, it was 116 and then 106 back in January. And so that's basically how income gets calculated. After we calculate all of the income, the next step is to go over expenses. But I'm going to pause right here, answer any questions for those that have questions about other income. Uh, Noah's asking, how common is it to see cash basis accounting versus accrual basis accounting? So Noah, I actually like to see both. Um, I tell my management company to send me an accrual basis accounting and a cash basis accounting. Uh, most management companies use accrual. Very few of them use cash uh, basis. And then like there's, I could count on my hands how many use a, a combination. There are companies that actually use a combination of those. Um, which I think is, is a better approach. Uh, to me, accrual by itself is not very accurate because what I care about in business is how much money do I have coming in? How much money do I have coming out? I don't care about invoices. I don't care about none of that stuff. And accrual focuses a lot on invoices and charges and all that stuff, but it doesn't really focus a lot on how much cash was actually you know, put in the bank account and how much cash went out. That's a whole other topic. I don't want to confuse people here, uh, but I personally prefer cash basis accounting. But that's a very good observation. Uh, Scott is asking, who's, at, who's talking at the very beginning of the webinar? That would have been uh, Jacqueline Landry. All right, cool. So moving on from this, let's go to the expense side of things. So with expenses, you're going to have a lot of different categories, right? You've got admin expenses, you've got general expenses, you've got payroll expenses. Um, so I'm going to go over them just to kind of help you understand all these different expenses. Um, admin expenses, as you can see, these are things like answering services, bank charges, computer expenses, credit services. Um, you know, you've got legal fees for courts if you've got maybe evictions or whatever, um, telephone fees, internet, all that sort of stuff. Usually admin expenses aren't that aren't that high. In this case, this was $900 for the month of March. That's totally normal. Uh, moving on from admin expenses, then we've got online marketing, right? So marketing, $681. That's pretty good. Uh, payroll. So payroll basically talks about, you know, who's getting paid at the property. Uh, you got the manager's salary, as you can see, $3,750 per month. You've got the maintenance, you've got the insurance, payroll taxes, and so that's about eight thousand four hundred per month. Um, after payroll, you've got your repair and maintenance, right? This is basically to get units up to date as as people move out. So when somebody moves out, they'll go in, they'll maybe change out the carpets, maybe they'll repaint the 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 walls, and you know maybe fix plumbing, whatever it is that they need to do to get the unit ready for the next person. So that's repair and maintenance and unit preparation. You know, both of these things are basically to me, essentially the same thing. So we actually combine those two uh, together when we underwrite these deals. Um, contract services is when you bring in an outside contractor to help you with landscaping, uh, maybe pest control, because you don't want to have a landscaper as, as part of your payroll because you're not, you don't need them all the time. Same thing with uh, pest control, same thing with, 
you know, waste removal, utility billing. Sometimes, you know, if, if we have vacant units that we need to, you know, fix up quickly, we might bring in outside contractors to help with, with their innovation so we can quickly, you know, improve the units and get them back on the market. So all of these things, like that would be considered temporary help. All of these things would be under contract services. Besides contract services, then you've got utilities. Um, one of the things that's interesting is whenever you look at a property income and expense, you want to look at the utilities that that is being charged as an expense on the property, meaning the water, the sewer, the electricity. And then you want to go back to your income, right? You want to go back to your income and you want to see, is the income the same? Is it lower? Is it higher? Most of the time, it's going to be about 75 to 90%. If it's not uh, 75 to 90%, of the expense that I'm incurring as a property owner, then I would increase the income here. Uh, so that way I, I get reimbursed more of it. Hope that makes sense. All right, moving on. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, utilities, uh, we just went over utilities. Uh, the next thing down here, you've got uh, property insurance. As you can see, that's $6,916 over here. It increased recently. Uh, taxes. $22,000 a month. And so that gives you total expenses um, of about $57,000 a month. So then the way you calculate your net operating income is you simply go up where it says total income, 112,000. And then you go all the way down and you reduce the expense, which is 57,785. And that gives you a net operating income of 54,732. And that is basically, you know, that to me is probably the most important number when I look at the, the T12, because I want to figure out how much income is the property producing on a monthly basis? Because when you go out to get a loan, right, the lender will look at your net operating income in order to size up how much the property is worth potentially, but also, you know, how much of a loan they should be able to, to give you. Um, so as you can see, our, our net operating income in March was 54,000. Our mortgage payment was $24,000. And so that leaves about $30,000 out of that, there was an asset management fee of 2250 So that gets that gets down to about, what is that, like $27,500 in net free um, cash flow. And then you've got these capital expenses like dishwashers, refrigerators, all these things that we, that we bought. Even though this is on the T12, this is really, you know, for rehab. And so I wouldn't really consider this uh, an expense on the property itself because we have money that we raised uh, and set aside specifically for these sort of things, because we knew we we're going to renovate units. Uh, so the reality is there was about $27,000 of net free cash flow. But then after you, you know, after you reduce that 7,500, there was, you know, you would have about a net income of $20,000, which is basically what I send out to the investors uh, this month, actually yesterday night. So basically that's, that's how a T12 goes. That's how investors make money in cash flow during the holding period is, is basically based on the money that's left over after all the bills are paid. And uh, that, that determines your cash, cash flow. And my target is when we buy a property is to clean this up as much as possible so that we can raise rents, raise other income, reduce our expenses so we can increase the net income that's left over to the investors. So I'll be taking questions before we move on to the rent roll, which is the next thing. Uh, boss, I have a quick question. Yep. When you were going through the different fees that would that could be associated, could be categorized as income, have you found a sweet spot where you're not getting too much pushback from tenants around, you know, this is really a fee heavy environment versus not charging the right amount for fees or not getting enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, my my philosophy on it is, you always want to keep increasing until you start getting pushback because really you, de you never know what the, what the maximum rent amount is. You never know what the maximum other income charges you could add until you start getting pushback from tenants saying, hey, this is too much. Or maybe start getting lo lower applicants. You get less showings because we don't want to go below 90% occupancy, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, if you know if if you keep increasing things and people are paying with no no problem, then you know you're not pushing uh, hard enough. Um, like I'll tell you, when we bought this property, we thought we could get rents up to fifteen fifty, uh, one thousand five hundred and fifty dollars a month. 
just yesterday, we leased out a unit at $1,625. So that's $75 above our projections. And yet we're still 100% occupied, or I'm sorry, 100% pre-leased, uh, meaning every person uh, every person that left and, and left a vacant unit, that same unit has been now leased at a higher rent. And so to me, even though now we got to $1,625, we could probably still push more because we're getting a lot of demand from tenants. So there is no way to find out until you keep pushing and find out what people decide to do. What are some of those data points that you use to track that pushback or threshold? Uh, mainly, mainly occupancy more than anything. Occupancy, we look at renewals. You know, when it comes to renewals and expirations, like if, if we have eight expired, uh, you know, eight expired leases, if I get less than, on, on a case like that, less than four renewals, then I know maybe people aren't very happy. Uh, with what's going on, or maybe they can't afford it. Um, and then if we put it on the market and it's not leasing, or we're maybe not getting as many applicants, then I know you know people aren't interested because prices could be a little too high. If, if marketing is not the problem, then it's usually the price. Um, and so then you just have to kind of mess around with it until you get the, the right number. But you got to remember, you know, one of the things I like to do is we have our regional manager do uh, an in-person comp study every few months, every three months, every four months, because we got to push as much as possible. But the, at the end of the day, you know, these tenants have alternatives, you know, maybe they're going to your neighbors, uh, maybe your neighbors have lower rent, maybe they have higher rent, you really don't know, you got to push your property as much as possible. And if things don't seem right, for whatever reason, maybe you're getting less occupancy, or maybe you're getting less tenants, then, you know, do an in-person market survey and figure out what other people are charging for their units. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, when you're doing this prior to acquisition, you're not going to really know exactly how much you could push up to. And so what I do is, you know, I call the comps, you know, and uh, we just call, ask how much they're, they're, they're charging, uh, the different size bedrooms and, and, and units that they have and all these different things. And based on that, I set up my projection of, hey, look, I think on this deal, I can take rents up to this amount. I can charge for these other fees because I see what the comps are charging for. And then if, I, if the numbers make sense for me, then I fly out, see the property. I go visit the comps just to confirm the, the data that I got over the phone. And if everything checks out, then I, I would put an offer on the property. Cool. Uh, let's see. Um, why do you pay for both manager payroll and management fee? Um, so the manager payroll, so I guess let me explain this. In multifamily, multifamily is different than single family. In single family, you don't have on-site staff. So you pay a management company their fee, which could be 7%, usually to 10%. And that covers all of your management expenses pretty much. Um, in multifamily, is different. You, you pay the management company about usually 3% to 5%, depending on the size of the property, 3 to 5% usually is the norm. And then on top of that, you have to pay for the on-site staff payroll, whether it's the leasing agent, you know, the, the, the manager, the maintenance people, all these different roles uh, you have to pay out of the property because their 3% might, you know, might only be like $40,000 a year. So it's not like a big amount. All right, Brian is asking, in rent control building uh, in LA, 24 units, what are the best ways to increase rent slash other income? Think rent control freeze in LA until February 1, 2024. So Brian, I don't buy in California for that purpose because I don't want to deal with rent control. Uh, for rents under market by $900, what are the best ways owners can bring rents closer to market, i.e. if tenant moves out, renovate unit? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of different strategies. You know, sometimes we look at units and we're like, look, you know, they're doing amazing marketing. They're just not updated. And if we update them like the comps are updated, we could get higher rents. Uh, and sometimes you look at a property like this property we bought, th there was no marketing. There, there was zero marketing. And on top of that, a lot of the units were classic. And so sometimes it's an operational fix, meaning you could go and just put it on more websites and get more traffic that way. And sometimes you have to cosmetically update it. Uh, and sometimes you have to do both. You have to cosmetically update it and do better marketing in order to increase rents. So it really just kind of depends uh, on a property by property situation. Cool. Any other questions? No? All right, moving on. Uh, actually, one more. I'm fresh into the multifamily space. Can you talk about some of the initial conversations to get the seller engaged? So uh, Dowden, I 
we don't talk to the sellers. We talk to brokers and uh, that's how we source our deals. And so because of that, we don't really have any conversations. This isn't focused on wholesaling multifamily. Uh, this is focused on buying multifamily real estate. All right, cool. So hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the rent roll. So the rent roll, like I said, basically has all of the different tenant names. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be showing this or not, to be honest with you, but it is what it is. Uh, you've got all the different tenant names, the units, the unit type, square footage, market rent, rent, vacancy, all these different things, miscellaneous charges. And then that gives you the total charges over here. Um, and then it gives here, you've got the move-in dates, the move-out date, lease and, and lease start. So what's important when you look at something like this? Uh, I'll tell you what's important for me is, is these things. I'm going to highlight them. Um, obviously, I don't care about tenant name. Uh, what I care about is I care about unit type, square footage. Um, I care about rent. And I care about uh, move-in time frame. I care about lease start time frame. Uh, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. So let's look at all these different things uh, one by one. Why is unit type important? Because we want to group all of the units by type and figure out what are the latest rents they've been achieving. Um, so that's important. As you can see here, you got the B1, two bedroom, one and a half bath. That's a thousand and three square feet. And in our model, or I'm sorry, in in our budget, it says the market rent is $1,600. Um, the current rent that's being charged for, for this person is $1,300, as you can see. So there's a gap, right? There's a gap. And this was before we bought the property. This was back in May. So they were achieving $1,300 a month rents. Uh, they added miscellaneous charges of $15. And so that brought the total charges of uh, $1,315. And uh, the lease started, as you can see, the lease started back in uh, May 24, 2022. And that's when the person moved in. So these are important. Why is that important? Because I want to figure out what are they getting on the latest leases that are getting, um, you know, that are moving in right now. So let me see if I can find us a newer lease from, say, you know, 2023 or something. So let's just kind of keep scrolling down. So this one, as you can see, uh, this one moved in March 10, 2023. The lease expires in a year, so it's a 12-month lease. Uh, they rented that uh, same unit, 1,003 square feet. And as you can see, the rent they're paying is 1,600 versus the rent that this person was paying, the first person that we were looking at right here, was 1,300. So that's about a, a $300 increase, right? $300 increase from what they were charging to what we are charging right now. And actually, you know, the, the, the units we're charging right now, it's, it's even higher than this. So, so that's basically what I look at. Whenever I'm looking at a property, I'm trying to figure out based on the latest strengths, what they have, what have they been achieving? Because that will show me the gap that I need to clean up. If they were charging, you know, 1300, but every other lease prior to that was like a thousand dollars. Uh, then that tells me I could bring up probably a lot of people from $1,000 to 1300 And so that gives you that, uh, that loss to lease that you could burn off to increase income and reduce the economic vacancy, which if, if we go back here, remember economic vacancy, that's loss to lease. Um, you know, the, the further you push rents and the higher you renew people at, the lower this number will be, which is good, right? You want to reduce this number as much as possible. But while you're reducing that number, you're also going to be pushing rent higher. And so this number will probably increase again because the new leases are even higher than the old leases. And so you're just in this constant cycle of pushing rent on the new tenants and then pushing rent on the old tenants. So that way you keep increasing your income. Um, so that's basically how this works. Um, whenever we analyze a deal, you know, obviously this one is a little bit easier because you've got basically two unit types, the 1,003 square feet and the 980 square feet. So this one is easier to underwrite. Uh, but a lot of times you're going to have multiple square footage. You're going to have multiple unit types. And um, the best way to do it, the best way to do it is to use an underwriting spreadsheet. So I'm going to show you our underwriting spreadsheet uh, and show you how, how this would work. Uh, let's see, there we go. 
So with an underwriting spreadsheet, you know, we take that data. So let me just kind of do this right now. So you saw how we said, hey, the, the unit type is B1, two bed, one and a half bath, I think it was, or something along these lines. Um, number of units, let's just say 84 right now. This is not real underwriting. Let me, let me zoom in so that way you could see this better. Uh, let's see, hold on. There we go. Um, and so here, the current rent, right? This is the latest rent that you are achieving on the property. So as you saw, we just got $1,600. Actually, yesterday we got $1,625. So I could probably push this even further, but it doesn't matter. Um, and then the square footage was 1,003 um, square feet. And so that shows you're getting $1.60 per, per, uh, per square feet. Maybe when I look at the deal, I'm like, hey, you know what? I did the comps. I looked at what other people are charging. I could probably push this to $1,750. And so that basically shows you how much increase of income you could have, which in this case would be uh, a 9% rental increase. Now on a small deal, or not a small deal, but on a, on a deal where you have less unit types, it's, it's not as hard to underwrite, but a lot of times you're going to have deals that have uh, multiple unit types where it's going to look, you know, like, like this. Sometimes there's so many unit types, you literally don't even have space to put them here anymore. And so with that many moving aspects, uh, you're going to have, let me see if I can uh, if I can find another one that has a lot more unit types. So this one has, as you can see, this one has multiple unit types. And because of that, you know, you're going to need an underwriting spreadsheet in order to be able to underwrite it uh, properly. Uh, so I highly recommend that if you underwrite multifamily deals that you use something like this, uh, where you could put in all the, all the, you know, the, the, the rental income, you could put in all the expenses and all these different factors into a model that can help you underwrite. Uh, same thing here. We've got basically the expenses, we've got the income and all these other aspects of it. Um, so anyway, let's go back to our, let's go back to our T12. As you're going through this, is this the T12? Yeah, this is the T12. So as you're going through this, what you're trying to figure out is, you know, how much could I push rent up to? How much income could I increase over here? You know, what other, what expenses can I cut down on? Like I said, one of the, you know, expenses, I guess I would say, uh, is the employee unit. So that's one of the things I would fix over time. Uh, on another deal we bought, we, we saw that there was a, a security guard expense. And to me, I didn't, I didn't need a security guard. So that was one of the first expenses we cut down on. That was like $35,000, $40,000 a year. Um, sometimes you're going to see a printer cost of like 600 bucks a month. It's the craziest thing ever. So all of these different things, you go through them and you're trying to figure out what could you reduce uh, spending on. Um, so if I go through these, you know, all of this looks pretty clean so far. I don't really find anything odd here. Uh, let's just go through the rest of it. Management fee, obviously, this is kind of a higher expense, but it's 3%, so it is what it is, or 3.5%. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing here to clean up really besides that. So in this property, the main goal is not to necessarily reduce expenses as much, but to increase income as much as possible, because that's where the money is going to be made. It's not, there is no expense problem. There's an income problem on the property, which is why we bought it to increase income. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. Would love to answer any questions and, um, you know, see if I could help in any other way. So if you've got a question, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. I'll answer any questions and uh, kind of go from there, or you can just post them in chat. By chance, are those templates available? Blank ones just to uh, share so that we can start to understand what some of the, the data points we should be better understanding. When you say templates, what templates are you talking about? The um, the last one, especially the, the model equity uh, that we saw where you're putting in the different types of units and you can see there's a lot of um, vernacular and terminology, I think, at least for me, it would be great to be, go research each one of those and better understand what it is and how it pertains to the bigger picture. Yeah, so the model equity deal analyzer is part of our mastermind. We've got a we've got basically a multifamily mastermind for those that are interested in delving deeper into this stuff. Um, and basically, the multifamily mastermind that we've got teaches you all of the different things you need to understand to buy your first multifamily deal. Uh, part of that is you get the template. I'm gonna let me share my screen. So. Part of that is you get 25 hours of content that teaches you literally everything you need to know to buy your first deal. But on top of that, obviously, you get the multifamily deal analyzer, you get a broker database, 
um, of all the different brokers in major markets to build relationships. And then if you do find a deal that you're interested in, you could submit it to us and we could review it with you to see if, uh, if there are any red flags that you should be aware of. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I I'm going to put the website in the link, or I'm sorry, in the chat. And uh, you could go to the website, book a 15 minute call and see if it's the right fit for you or not. So modelequity.com forward slash mastermind. All right, cool. Um, YL is asking, YL, I'm curious what your real name is. Uh, is it better to buy a low cap property that has income potential for a lower price or is it better to buy a high cap rate, but at a higher price? Um, YL, you know, there is no way to just put out a blanket statement that says yes or no. I would say it really depends on the property and what you could do with it. Um, to me, cap rate doesn't matter too much if I could increase income uh, quickly to get to market levels. Uh, because I'll just give you an example. Let's say you're looking at a 100 unit deal and I'm just gonna give you an extreme example. Let's say that 100 unit deal has zero tenants. In a case like that, you're going to have obviously uh, almost a non-existent cap rate, but let's say a very low cap rate. And so, you know, if you just value a deal based on cap rate, that might be like a terrible deal. But what if the deal was only $10,000 per unit? Then it might be a great deal if you could buy it and, and put in tenants and renovate it and do all these things. So to me, it's not about the cap rates. What matters is what could I do to the property and could I achieve the investor returns that we want to achieve? Uh, cool. Uh, Jackie. Hey, Abbas. So um, in, in the last deal that, that you looked at, the Iowa deal, there was probably, um, I took your advice and I went through and itemized all of the different um, apartment types and there was over 60. Oh my God. There was just a few that had the same square footage. So at the end of the day, how would you group those to then determine what to put in the pro forma. Would you do an average, um, right? Literally some of them were like 765, some of them were 766, some of them were 768. Yeah. So they were all over the, all over the board. So just wanted to know like in the future, if I happen to um, see that again, well, how do I like, group yeah. them? I mean, here's the thing. That deal was a very unique deal. Just to give everybody some background, Jackie's part of the mastermind, by the way. But that deal, it was a, it was a factory, right? It was a factory. It was an uh, an old historic building turned into apartments. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's it's a very unique situation where it wasn't built as apartments, and so because of that, all these rooms were different, all the bedrooms were different, all the units were different, and so. Um, you couldn't really group them up together because they didn't have unit types. It wasn't designed that way. Um, so I would say it's hard to answer that. I would probably, if I ran into a deal like that, I would probably group them based on, um, you know, how close they are in square footage. Like if there was multiple ones that are at 740, 750, 760, I'd probably, you know, put these together as long as they have the same bedroom count. Uh, but the reality is that's the first, we, underwrite literally i mean we've underwritten thousands of deals and that's the first deal i've run into that has that many unit types so i don't think that's a problem you're going to run into too often thanks so I, yeah i wouldn't really i wouldn't design a strategy for that one specific property hey abbas i got a quick question could you in that yeah. scenario could you just look at strictly the price per square footage and come up with some kind of an average yeah but the, you mean when with rent, but the thing is, you know, tenants don't look at price per square feet. A lot of times they, they look at comps, but they also prioritize from what I've noticed, they prioritize bedrooms. So like a one bedroom apartment um, is, even if it was the same square footage as a two bedroom apartment, the one bedroom apartment would get less rent uh, because people prefer more bedrooms than they prefer square footage. So just the right. price per square foot method would be, um, in my opinion, would give you incorrect results. Hey, Abbas, I had one more question on that with respect to um, uh, taxes. So mm -hmm. in this particular instance, um, it's also very unique. There was a tax abatement because it was historic property. Right. So they were given a lower tax rate for a number of years. So um how do you put that in the tool? Because every single year the taxes will increase, but by a lot less. And at some point that, that gift 
um, that the municipality gives you ends, right? So how do you put that in your tool um, to make sure that you're accurately underwriting for that? So, yeah, I mean, this is a very unique situation, but if I had to underwrite it, if I had to underwrite it, I would say uh, one way to do it is you could go, let me just open up the underwriting tool. Uh, you could go to uh, the cash flow model tab mm -hmm. and oh, let me see. If you zoom in, if I zoom in, um, there's a line item that says non non op expenses. So these are kind of like, you know, maybe one time expenses or whatever that you could put in here for year one through year six. Um, so maybe, you know, you're expecting, wait, are you expecting it to increase or decrease over time? Increase. Increase. Yeah. So maybe here I would say, look, if, if you're projecting uh, a $5,000 increase here, and then maybe a $10,000 increase here, you could do that. Um, another way to do it is to use this. Uh, and this is what we actually use is we're like, Hey, look, taxes are going to be, let me zoom in again. Um, so this is specific, I guess, for, you know, uh, Texas, uh, but you could really use it for anything. So here we could say, look, taxes year one are going to be 400,000. Year two, they're going to be 425,000. Um, you know, and then maybe after year three, you could say, look, they're going to go up by 3%, 3%, 3%. So you could, you could use this as well, or you could, you could use this right here. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Any other questions? Um, are all of the items in the expenses section tax deductible? Yes, 100%. Um, so those definitely are, you know, they reduce your income. So for sure. All right. Any other questions? Anybody else? I know this webinar was a, a lot more detailed and a lot more nuanced than we normally do, but I think these are helpful. Yeah. Hey, hey, boss Sherman, man. How you doing? Doing well. How are you, Sherman? Hey. Real quick, where do we go in the future to watch these uh, webinars? So they're actually all on my YouTube. Um, if you go on YouTube and you type in my name, Abbas Muhammad, you're going to be able to find all the all the previous webinars. When you click on videos, you can see anything that's like 45 minutes, an hour long is, is a webinar. Sounds good. Yep. So sorry, Abbas, I do have one more question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Based on our, our review of the underwriting tool. So again, with this being a unique property, one of the things that you mentioned is if the piping, the the water, the water piping is done with iron pipe versus copper pipe, you should not try to institute low flow toilets um, or or you know energy for, or um, water efficient shower heads. Um, so we found the answer to that, and it is copper for the most part, and then plastic going into, into each of the units. So would that still constitute as a water conserve? Would, would that still be something that you would do is institute the, the low flow toilets and the shower heads? Good question. So just to give everybody some background on that, um, whenever you buy a property, one of the things you could do on older apartments is you could bring in what's called um, a water savings program. So they would take the toilets, they would take the showers and they would swap them out for other toilets and other shower heads and all these things that, uh, that spend less water. And especially if you, if the landlord is paying for the water, then that's a great amount of savings for you, um, which reduces your expenses, which then adds value to your deal. Um, one issue that I know other operators have faced is that when they've done that on properties that have um, iron-based uh, plumbing, a lot of times you, you have to flush multiple times just to clean up the toilets. And so you don't end up really saving, uh, saving any money because tenants have to flush multiple times. With copper plumbing, um, you know, there, there isn't as big of an issue, but with, with iron-based plumbing, it is. And so it's important to find out you know, what the plumbing is made of. Uh, now the question is, you know, this is majority of it is, is copper, but then some parts are plastic. And so does that affect it? I would say I would ask the property, uh, I would ask the, the water savings company and see if they ran into that. I would, I would think that's a very unique situation as well, because usually it's either iron or it's plumbing. So I would check with the water savings company, but just keep in mind that they get paid when they sell you something. So maybe check with the water savings company and maybe see if, if you could find a contractor that knows, you know, this stuff and, and if they could give you some color on it. Uh, but 
I wouldn't be the expert on that, but that's definitely something I would try to get an answer on before I put that in my underwriting. Thank you. So I should play the lottery tonight. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many moving parts of that deal. It's crazy. Thanks. You're welcome. Of course. Any other questions? Anybody else? Hey, Abbas. So uh, my question is, how, just for the sake of uh, comparing to the other buildings, to, to the comps, how easy or hard is it to get like their expenses? Do they share? I mean, or is there any website that uh, you can get the average uh, for those buildings in that area or no? How, 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 do, you, how do you do that? Yeah, so, so there is really no website to do it um you're not really going to be able to get someone else's expenses because a lot of times i they're just they're not going to share those of course um but what you can do is you can find out how much rent they're charging and and you know what other charges they've got at the property and the way to do that is to basically call and or visit them in person and basically ask that way that's actually we have a whole module filmed on how to do that. Uh, but basically, you know, what I do is I just call, I ask the, the leasing staff and I get, and we have a way of doing it to, to, you know, get information effectively, but that's how we do it. And then, you know, we get, we get what the other rents are at, and then we compare them to what the current property rents are. So you have to do due diligence, basically manually. There is no way of doing it, you know, automatically. However, I will say this, if you are, focused on a specific market, like we're focused on, on Dallas. Um, a lot of times, you know, we, we might be underwriting a deal here, but we've underwritten multiple deals in the vicinity. So even though, you know, I'm not buying the comp, I might, I might have an underwriting from six months ago, from 12 months ago, where I've been, I've looked at the T12, I looked at the rent roll. So I pull those up and I look at, you know, what their expenses were and what their rental income is and all that sort of stuff. Obviously I would still call to get the new, new rents, but that's that's a good way. Like we've got we've got so many underwritings in our database now because we've underwritten so many deals. I could pull up a lot of different comps that we've underwritten whenever I look at a property. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Anybody else? No. Last call. No questions. Very cool. So for those that want to see deals and passively invest in multifamily. Maybe you, you look at this and you're like, you know what, this is too much work. I really don't want to do it on my own. You could go on our website, modelequity.com. And if you register on our website, you could see our future investment offerings. And so you could, you know, book a call with me, invest in future deals passively. So you don't have to do all the work yourself. Um, so if you go on our website, modelequity.com, you could register for that. And if you're interested in finding out more information about our mastermind and learn how to buy multifamily deals actively and book a call with me for free again to see if it's the right fit for you or not you could go to modelequity.com forward slash mastermind and you could book a 15 minute call but anyway i hope this has been helpful if you decide to book a call great if not i'll see you all next week on tuesday appreciate you coming on thank you see ya